and that would be a secret foreign policy. The CIA would be used secretly, covertly, and illegally. But nobody knows, right? It's all covert. And here's the thing. Remember I mentioned a shadow government? What we have here beginning in 1953 is that this will allow the president to do a secret foreign policy unknown to the people in the United States. So politically, when they go and answer to the people at an election or in Congress, they can say one thing and nobody knows what's behind the scenes. And this will have terrible consequences down the road. Because, okay, politically in the United States we'll be thinking one thing, but around the world they'll be thinking something totally different about the United States. And when you have this where they meet, there'll be terrible misunderstanding and not know really what goes on here for American history and politically as we see it now with this perpetual war on terror war. Frankly, we have no idea what's going on. I wish I could say we did, but we don't. If you don't believe me, President Trump announced that we accept the Carl Vinson, an aircraft carrier in North Korea. His Secretary of Defense said it. His press secretary said it. I mentioned it in class. No. They never got the order. They were, they were going to the Persian Gulf. I don't have any idea what's going on. And so we talk about, you know, I follow this. We have a secret foreign policy to this day. Now it's more secret now. It starts here. And where you see this is with this pigeon. You put a camera on them, they can fly over and get pictures of anything. That's a camera. This is in the East German Spy Museum, the Stasi Museum. If you get a chance in Berlin, it's awesome. That's a camera in a trench coat from 1954. Pretty cool. Pocket for quick. Take a picture out of your hand. All right, so Iran will be the first thing. So I'm going to give you two examples of this right now. Where the Cold War and Cold War politics will run into then our dealing with, let's say, a democracy in a country. And what do we do if this democracy does what we don't want? What is not good for American business? So Iran, in the late 40s, a homegrown democracy is created. So we're coming up to what's going to happen in 1953, but the homegrown democracy, this is a big deal. Iran had had years of a really kind of repressive, they were technically kings, shahs, but in reality they were just brutal dictators. But they developed a constitutional monarchy, a parliamentary system, homegrown, very Iranian, their own political parties. And they had right-wing monarchist parties who wanted more power for the king, all the way to a communist toll party. I mean, a very vibrant democracy. Home run. This is a big deal. They did it on their own. And so they have their own homegrown democracy. Yet the big issue was Iran is still a very poor, poor country. And their president, picked by parliament, it's a parliamentary system, Mohammed Mosaddegh. He's a nationalist. When I mean nationalist, he doesn't really have a complete political ideology except for the same thing, this basic idea, I must do whatever's good for Iran. Here's Iran, and the thing about Iran was this. Go to the 20th century. British and Australian explorers found all this oil here, and they bribed the corrupt monarchs, the corrupt Shah of Iran, to give almost all the profits to British Petroleum, which was then owned by the government of Britain. This company created to get oil for their ships. You remember dreadnoughts? It was to get oil for dreadnoughts. Almost 98% of all the money, the revenues, from the oil that came out of Iran by 1952 went to British Petroleum. And so you have a growing demand for oil. A country that is impoverished, you get none of that wealth. And Parliament in Iran wanted some of that money. And Britain would not renegotiate that contract. In fact, Britain did everything they could to insult Iran. They called them their old name, Persia, all the time, which was a huge slap in the face. Huge slap in the face. And so Parliament nationalized it. Mosaddegh's the president, he wanted this, he'd become a symbol, but this was done by their parliament. Nationalized means the government of Iran took over the oil. 
And these are rainy workers laid a pipeline to the coast, one of the biggest oil refineries in the world. It still exists on this card island, overseen by the Englishmen. Very. Now, the idea was take over the oil so the revenues stay in Iran. Now, Britain blockaded them, was furious, and they want to overthrow Mossadegh. And Mossadegh is going to become the symbol of fighting against economic imperialism. In fact, this is him. Um, there's Mossadegh, and the idea of this now movements to break away from imperialistic rule, like in Iran, same thing in Egypt has happened. Mossadegh would become na internationally known. Yeah? Why was it offensive to have Persia? That's not, they want to be, they changed the name of the country to Iran. Persia, as they saw, it, was their old, uh, um, the name of the old decrepit monarchy, where a new modern Iran. And all Iran means is Aryan, for Aryan people. That's all it means. And, and so they went to Truman to ask for help to overthrow Mossadegh. Truman refused. Truman's like, we want them as allies. Make a deal. But 52, when this happened, Eisenhower was elected president. Yeah. Was Truman still president? Yeah. In 52, he was president when they nationalized it. But they had the election. And so Eisenhower had. Uh, and he's already told, announced that the Dulles brothers, after the election, would be state and CIA. Before Eisenhower is even president, so he's president-elect, the new prime minister of Britain, who actually came into power because of this, personally met with Eisenhower and the Dulles brothers. So he's not even president yet. The new prime minister was an old friend of Eisenhower, Winston Churchill. Remember, he was prime minister during World War II. Churchill's back in, quite old by then, head of the conservative party. Now, they didn't say, hey, Mossadegh and the Iranians are stealing the oil. In fact, the joke, what the, Irish, the British said, and I quote this, we stole that oil fair and square. He didn't say that. What they said was, Mossadegh is a communist communist. He was not a communist, even though there were communists in Iran. He was not. Everyone got that. The British said he's communist, and that guy lies now in the Dulles Brothers. Absolutely. Domino theory, containment, the communists will win. A lot of what they got arrest, uh, elected on <laughs> was the bomber gap and China. And now, and the Korean War is going on. Are we going to let Iran go the same way? So... This is when Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, would initiate Operation Ajax, which is blatantly violating the law of the United States. Blatantly violating the law. Ajax would be the operation to overthrow Mossadegh. And basically, it would be to just bribe the army. And the thing about it was, poor country, you to bribe people. And the other thing the Americans had was, Mossadegh and the Iranians trusted the United States. The United States said they will defend democracy against communism. So they did not, or they allowed the U.S. to do things out of their embassy that they would never allow the British to do, who they didn't trust, because they believed the United States would defend democracy. So we used, the CIA used that trust of the United States to overthrow their democracy. And the plan was they bought off the army, and they also bought off fundamentalists, Shia mullahs. And they said, you know, this Mossadegh is going to get rid of religion. Hmm. Fundamentalist Muslims. This won't have consequence down the road, will it? No. No worry here. Yes, the U.S. will do this a number of times against communism. Don't go with the Soviets. They will get rid of Islam. We will fund them and support them, and this will have terrible consequences down the road. So, with that, the first attempt actually failed. The second attempt worked. And the reason it worked is, hey, it's a poor country. They basically just engineered a mob and got some people out there, paid them off, and then that some of the people that paid off were circus performers. So they got jugglers and people on unicycles and stuff like that. And 
So they did them in squares all over Tehran. People came out to watch the show, and then they just walked through and gave people money. And they started, you know, they had the juggler start juggling and going to, let's say, they going to the parliament, going to Mossadegh's home to make it look like this march against him. And pretty soon they got guys chanting down with Mossadegh, which you see right there. And, you know, like a mob mentality, everybody joined in. So when you want to start a rebellion, jugglers. Or another way to look at it, don't trust jugglers. Can anyone here juggle? See, I wouldn't say it either because, yeah. You want to bring tyranny. And it worked. It happened so surprisingly fast that Mossadegh, here he is being arrested, and the government would be overthrown and replaced with the constitutional monarch, but now the dictator, Shah Rezi Mullah. When I was a youth, growing up, it was the Shah of Iran. What happened to the oil? You're exactly right. 40% will go to British Petroleum. 40% will go to U.S. oil companies. Here's what I said. These are, it will go to corporations. It's not going to go like the American people somehow. No, this is to companies. And then 20% would go, anybody want to guess? To him. Which he is going to build, make a very repressive dictatorship with a really horrible secret police that would arrest any of the old vestiges of the democracy horrible tortures, people would be executed, trained by the CIA. It'd be also a base right next to the Soviet Union for radar stations, spy planes. The, he would buy billions of dollars worth of military equipment. And the Emperor Royal from 1974. But here's the thing. What I just told you in this about this dictatorship, nobody in the U.S. knew. We didn't know. We did not know this. This would not become known until 76 and 77. Nobody knew about this dictatorship. The dictatorship was kept secret. In America, what was presented in the media was Mossadegh was a communist tyrant and the Shah represented freedom from communist terror. <coughs> this is a, exactly what. This is a fight of the Cold War. The good guys won. And so in the United States, we did not realize this stuff. Oh, there'd be stories, but that be brushed aside as communist tyranny. And so in the late 70s, when the people of Iran began to begin to through a revolution against this tyrant, part most of the blame was focused on, you can see it right here, the US. And that was from 78. Yeah. So what was the time magazine um, that had was it that? Yeah. That was 52. Oh, okay. Robert E. Nationalized. He, he would go into house arrest. In fact, a lot of when they started the revolution, they wanted to remove Mossadegh, but it would be quickly subverted by fundamentalist Shia Muslims, the same ones they helped pay off back in 54, the descendants of that. And they would take over. Who did they blame? The United States. And by the way, isn't it easy to not worry about the problems in your own country but blame somebody else outside? Find somebody else to blame. Use that as a way to get power. Say, you must give me power or those other people will come back and take over, which is how they did it. They're going to put the Shah back to power. It's how they took power. And they still hold power today. And they did it once before, so they believed it. Now, in America, they would never do that kind of thing. You know, scapegoat somebody. And, hey, the nativists have been doing that since 1840. Blaming somebody else. Immigrants from coming in or causing all the problems. This is not... The United States is not immune to this kind of thing either. And yes, Iran still is responsible for their government, but they blame the United States. And within America, nobody could figure out why Iranians were mad at the U.S. There must be something wrong with them or their religion or their attitude or something. No. America overthrew a democracy. And here's the last thing we have to get, or one more thing we have to get down. Please write this down. Every other attempt at democracy in the Mideast would fail. Why? They all knew if we have a democracy, what's going to happen to us? We'll be overthrown. The Soviets didn't want that. 
The Americans didn't want that. And so what do we have? Dictators everywhere. Pretty repressive dictators that we still support immensely. Like, you know, Saudi Arabia. Heck, we, we made sure two times that Iraq wouldn't have a democracy. Syria one time. Make sure they wouldn't have a democracy. Heck, we supported the party that would lead to Saddam Hussein in Iraq. This will have terrible consequences. In fact, it's hard to even go through all of them. In fact, this is going to be called blowback. And the blowback is the unintended consequences. Unintended consequences of these foreign policy decisions. Unintended consequences of, of covert action. Unintended consequences. This was seen as a great victory. Eisenhower was overjoyed in 53. By the late 70s, people who knew and understood what was going on were like, oh my God, did we screw up? And you see that time after time after time. This event is going to lead to a chain of events that will directly affect us to this very day. It's going to lead a revolution in Iran, a hostage crisis where Iranians are going to storm the U.S. Embassy and hold 55 Americans hostage for over a year and a half, almost a year and a half. In 1979 through 1981, it's going to lead to fear of fundamentalist Islamic revolution all over the Middle East. That will so terrify the Soviet Union that they will invade a country called Afghanistan, and the U.S. will aid fundamentalist Sunni Muslims that will fight the Soviets, including a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. And then when it was over, we left. Good luck. And then, uh, chaos there, which we come back to about this, because we're there now in our longest war ever, and I have no idea how that's going to end. Nobody has won in Afghanistan. That's the British, 12,000 men went in, one came out, 1941. And this would also lead for the dictatorship in Iraq, fearful of this revolt to attack Iran. Iran almost looked like they were starting to win, so we helped Iraq get chemical weapons which then they would use on their own people to keep a revolution from happening. It would trigger an invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in 1990, which would lead to the first Gulf War. And then kind of this perpetual low-grade war all the way until well, 2001, a direct connection to the 9-11 attack and the invasion of Iraq. And what's happening in Syria? All a direct line to this. This is a big deal. And so when we talk about blowback, you can see all these connections. And one of the problems or advantages of being somebody who's an historian, I look at this and I thought back in 2001, we don't want to go into Afghanistan. Blowback. I'm still there. And I was in a distinct minority of being opposed to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Still went. And we're still paying for that because of this. So I'm not going to go through every deal, but we'll go. Let's get another one. Guatemala, 1954. And by the way, no, I'm not clairvoyant. I just knew what happened before. No, I didn't know what were the results. In some ways, it wasn't quite as bad as I thought. In some ways, it's a lot worse. Guatemala, 1954. Same thing happened. Homegrown democracy. And this is going against basic diplomacy. But remember, Guatemala is a very poor country. Very poor country. And their democracy, uh, Francisco Arbenz would become the president, different constitution. He too is a nationalist. What do you do in an incredibly impoverished country? How do you get any kind of stable republic if you have so many people with basically nothing? There is wealth there. What is that big fruit company? Not Dole. Chiquita, but they went, their actual formal name is, they marketed her Chiquita. I actually wrote down untied fruit, so I added united, but still untied. So it's just united fruit. United fruit, remember that? The octopus, they called it? The octopus either, either directly or indirectly controlled 98% of the arable land in Guatemala. Bananas. A few other things, but bananas the big. And so what our band is looking at, like all this wealth that's leaving and going to stockholders of the United Fruit Company. How do we keep it here? What he proposed, land reform. Buy the land from United Fruit, force them to sell. Say, we pass a law saying, you got to sell your land. But go buy it. And then give it to peasants. 
Has everyone got that? That's land reform. Then give it to the peasants of Guatemala so they can grow the uh, uh, bananas. Basically, they're thinking like co opt to small farmers and they can sell it and make sure the profits stay there. And this would be tried in a number of different places, but immediately, John Foster Dulles looked at this, and Dulles, who, by the way, was a stockholder of the United Fruit, but he immediately looked at this and decided that our bands must be a communist, yes. Our bands. Our bands is a communist. And the CIA began to prepare an invasion of Guatemala by doing a secret base in Honduras. Now, remember what I'm telling you. Nobody knew inside the United States what's going on. But everybody in Iran and the Middle East knew what happened in Iran. They all knew. And the stories would get exaggerated and misinterpreted, but they knew the U.S. did. Just like all over Latin America. They know what's going on. But in the United States, all they get is our Benz is a communist. So they, they found a bunch of people, and they're kind of a bunch of bugs and hooligans. I mean, it really was this motley crew. They begin to train in Honduras. Why Honduras? Compliant dictator. Give him some money. Let us. And they eventually, in fact, they were about ready to invade. The assumption was they crossed the border and our bands would flee, just run away. That was the plan. Really good plan, huh? We'll cross the border, our band runs away. But then they thought, oh, we need a leader. Somebody's got to be in charge. And so they found a leader of this revolution, Carlos Armas. And there's Armas right there. Armas. He was a colonel in the Guatemalan army, basically said, would you like to become the dictator? And look at this picture of him on the stand. Unfortunate choice of mustaches for our, our moms. And I mean, everybody in Guatemala knew this was not a real revolution. But in the United States, John Foster Dulles likened this man to he is the next George Washington. So it implied that they are freedom fighters. And people did not know that the CIA was training them. The CIA actually had a few planes piloted by Americans, but claiming to be this freedom, this Guatemalan Freedom uh, Army's Air Force, a powerful radio station broadcasting propaganda. They crossed the border with these guys, and yeah, that's almost a purposely humorous, it looks like, view of the. And a couple border guards in Guatemala, they had no real army, fired a couple shots, and they ran away. Invasion over, right? No, the CIA was undeterred. They jammed Guatemalan radio stations and broadcast our Moss's armies winning victory after victory. And an underdeveloped like, country like Guatemala, that could really work. And then they had a few planes. Guatemala had no air force. So they buzzed the capital and dropped a few small bombs, giving the impression our Moss was winning. And then on the roof of the U.S. Embassy, they put massive speakers and broadcast battle sounds. So all these explosions went all over Guatemala City, implying that Armas's army is on the way. Our Benz realized he has no chance. The United States is going to do whatever it takes to get rid of him, and that might cost thousands of lives. Our Benz resigned. Armas, there he is riding in. There's Armas with his junta of leaders. And by the way, this is a great picture. That's CIA. That's CIA guys driving them in. In the U.S., this was presented as tyranny on the run. Democracy wins a big victory in Guatemala. And, of course, Armas did create a very vibrant democracy. That is not what did he create. A 30-year dictatorship. A very brutal dictatorship. Guatemala kind of has a democracy today, but if you know anything about the politics there, it's very shaky because poverty rate is so high. The land is still owned by mostly foreign U.S. companies. And they know if they do try to do anything to change that. Thing is, all over Latin America, they knew. That's why in '59, when Vice President Nixon went to Venezuela, his motorcade was attacked and they had to cancel his trip. And Americans were like, boy, there must be a lot of crazy radicals down there. Don't they understand we're the good guys? No, they knew about this. In America, we didn't know rumors, things, not until '76 do we know about this. And so, big deals. And so, this is going to become the era of pact mania, where we're going to create defense pacts with everybody. NATO, CETO, CENTO. Do you like those? NATO, CETO, CENTO. <laughs> and we know what NATO is, right? Remember that's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Well, now 
after a country that never wanted foreign entanglements, we are now in Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, all surrounding now China and Russia, and Soviet Union, I got it, I know. And this one still doesn't make sense how they came up with this, but it's CENTO, which is Central Asia Treaty Organization. Yeah, I don't know why they did it this way, but CENTO. Originally, it was called the Baghdad Pact. And the point for Pact Mania is think about what this has done in the Cold War. In years of the Cold War, the United States is now militarily committed all over the world. What a big change. We are so convinced that the communists are attacking and poking and prodding, which is a small degree of truth there, but we are now committed to defend pretty much every place in the world. So think about it for a second. Now we're going to put, we're going to sell all these weapons, make a lot of money selling them to these countries, and put bases everywhere. When the Cold War ends, we're not going to say, okay, war over, we're going to pull out. But what do we do? We stay and build more. Once you start, it's hard to stop. We have over 300 bases around the world outside of the United States, 300 military bases. Some are very small, some are huge. And this is all legacy from this time because of the Cold War, which, by the way, kind of fits in with your essay questions, I would imagine. And what a big change. This was not the America before World War II. This is the only America we have known, and it starts here. So is CETO why we got in the Vietnam War? South Vietnam, we become a member of CETO. Very good, 1957. Yep. Okay. So we could claim that the Civil War there was an invasion of by communists. Exactly. And so, with that, let's talk about this. French Indochina, this colony that in many ways started World War II. After the war, the French wanted their colony back. But a war developed. The Viet Minh were nationalists. They wanted an independent country. They were freedom fighters. Nothing in terms of freedom as freedom from colony, colonization. You can argue whether or not they have good goals or bad goals, but they wanted freedom from French rule. At first, the US kind of wanted the French out, but then it became a Cold War issue. And these are Viet Minh soldiers. The Chinese seemed political, um, a political advantage helped the Viet Minh. China and Vietnam don't like each other. But in the short run, political advantage. And the leader of the Viet Minh, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a communist. And once he became a communist, this became dominant theory. It became in the US, it's not the French trying to keep their colony, it's the free world trying to stop colony or trying to stop communism. Which actually is kind of amusing. A brutal colonial, a, a brutal colonial rule the US will defend. And there's Ho Chi Minh, uh, Indochina's Ho Chi Minh on time. Here he is with American advisors. The U.S. helped the Viet Minh fight the Japanese in World War II. It was real deal. And in fact, since we should support Ho Chi Minh, he's somebody we should support. Well, by 1952, 75% of the French war effort was funded by the U.S. It became such a cold war issue, the U.S. kept pumping money into France to hold on to this. And by 52, the French wanted out. Because of ambushes, they could hardly use the roads. They were just isolated in a few cities along the coast. And they realized it's not worth it. They had over 500,000 men. But in 54, by the way, big deal. This all directly relates to the Cold War. The French landed in a little town called Dien Ben Phu, right here. When it's in, today, it's in northwestern Vietnam. And it was to cut off a Viet Minh supply route. They thought they could parachute them in, and they did. They took the base. It was a great supply surprise. The problem is, how do you get them out? Helicopters were just being used, but the French only had a couple. I mean, little, two. By the way, helicopters, that's why the United States thought they'd win in South Vietnam. We have helicopters, we won't have this problem. They dropped them in, they landed, and very quickly the Viet Minh, Ho Chi Minh, and his generals reacted quickly and laid siege to there. In 1954, they surrounded them, would not let them out, and 
President Eisenhower even considered using nuclear weapons to help the French here. That's how bad it got. Eisenhower thought about it, but he would be dissuaded partially by the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson, who would be the president to commit American forces in the Civil War and stop the South Vietnam. The French, here they And they would sign the Geneva Accords giving them independence. But the problem was this. Yes, he gave them independence, but there had to be elections in 1956 to unify Vietnam under one leader. It also created an independent Laos and Cambodia. <laughs> the idea is one Vietnam. And there is John Foster Dulles talking about this in 56. And what he's laying out at that moment is simply this. The U.S. Will not, does not want elections because Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh would win. So the United States convinced the South to violate the Geneva Accords and create two separate countries. And as Liz said, the South would join CETA. North and South Vietnam. So you hear about the Vietnam War? That's what the Vietnam War is about. The United States wants two Vietnams. Well, the North, and probably the majority of people in the South, is it would turn out what one independent, unified Vietnam. That's the fight. The leader the United States would finally support would turn out to be a pretty awful dictator, Nguyen, Nguyen Zem. I know it's a D, but the, the French butchered their language was pronounced easy. Zem. Zem would become the dictator of South Vietnam. Very repressive dictator. Have you, you know what nepotism is? <coughs> giving jobs to your family members, government jobs. Zem would be infamous for giving all just these jobs, and, they, and then they just got richer than rich. Corrupt dictator, but he was our dictator. It's all we have. And a civil war would develop in South Vietnam. The National Liberation Front would be created by the North to try to unify North and South, but it was Southern guerrilla fighters. Zim would quickly call it the Viet Cong because that means Viet Cong communists. They knew how to freak out the United States. And that would be the beginnings of the Vietnam War. That's the Vietnam War. And Eisenhower began to send the first U.S. troops to train South Vietnamese troops in 1959 and the first Americans to die in Vietnam. Would be, Travel with a cousin, Wheeler. Would be 1959. So, sorry I'm a little bit behind, but that's live. Everybody then, while this is going on, Three big events that would, in many ways, trigger the, the civil rights movement would happen. And the civil rights movement will have Cold War implications, which we'll get to in the video. So everybody find the rage within. I'll tell you where the rage within is. This video has three worksheets. Three buoys in there because I wasn't sure what I was going to show you. But if you find the one on top that says the road to the 60s, we're not doing that one. On the other side, it has the rage within. It's a great video. I've never seen anything better to cover this era of the civil rights movement. What a time. What a great time. Yeah. Turn to the other side. What's on the other side? Road to the 60s. Road to the 60s. On the other side of Road to the 60s, it says the rage within. Go get it. What the hell? Where go get it? What do you mean, go get it? Man, that ball way in left field. I don't care what field it's Will it bring it all to They hate the they will it. They hate in 1954, Willie Mays hit 41 home runs. The following year, he hit 50. In the 1950s, Willie Mays was the most spectacular player in the once the color barrier in baseball has been broken, Mays was visible proof of what talented black athletes could do if given the chance. 
and he threw the guy out. But in parts of the country, this all-star baseball player was less than a second-class citizen. In southern states, whites beat and murdered blacks without fear of retribution. At the same time, athletes, entertainers, and musicians were changing the very character of American culture. These cruel contradictions would spark a smoldering rage. The time had come for America to examine the color of its soul. So, I know, let me finish this tomorrow. I dream of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. By and large, 